Right. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the opening session of the Offshore Wind Conference. My name is Patricia Hawthorne. Um, I'm a partner in law firm Shep and Wedderburn, and I work out of our Glasgow and London offices. Um, I'm also chairman of Scottish Renewables, uh, the representative body in Scotland for the renewables industry and its supply chain. Today we'll be looking at the very topical issues of cost reduction in offshore wind deployment, the part that the offshore wind sector can play in supporting the UK government's industrial strategy, and the wider prospects for offshore wind across the UK and Europe uh, and beyond. Before I introduce our panel, can I pick up with you a couple of housekeeping points? First of all, there are no fire alarms scheduled, so if an alarm sounds, please leave the building uh, by the nearest available exit and uh, as directed by SEC staff. And uh, could I ask you all to make sure your phones and other electronic devices are now on silent? Thank you. So we have an excellent lineup for our session this morning, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing what our panel have to say. Um, our first speaker looking at cost reduction and industrialization is Jonathan Cole, Managing Director, Iberdrola Renewables Offshore Wind Division. Jonathan is responsible for the development, construction and operation of projects in the UK, Germany, France and the US. And this includes the three and a half gigawatts of projects off the East Anglian coast. He also sits as chairman of a number of industry bodies, including the UK government's Offshore Wind Programme Board and the Global Offshore Wind Health and Safety Organisation. Jonathan spoke so eloquently at the Scottish Renewables Conference, uh, Offshore Conference in January this year that he was an obvious candidate to open our session today. So please join me in welcoming Jonathan Cole. Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much, Pat, for the, the introduction. Um, it was after the Scottish Renewables Conference, in fact, that I was asked, would I come and give the same speech to the All Energy Conference? And I said, yes, of course, that'll be easy, because I can just give the same speech. And then as I'm sitting here just now, looking out in the audience, I'm seeing quite a lot of the same people who were at that other conference. So for many of you, this is going to seem like Groundhog Day, so I apologise for that. But nevertheless, um, it doesn't, as we see right now um, in politics, if you've got a good message, you should repeat it as often as you can, and eventually people will start to listen to you. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about cost reduction and industrialization, but first of all, I just want to make some opening remarks about what it's like to work in this offshore wind sector. And I, and I think that um, those of us who work in the sector uh, should feel an enormous sense of pride about all that we do and all that we've achieved. We, we, we're an industry that promises so much, um, and we're an industry that absolutely has been delivering on its promises. So, you know, an industry that really, from a standing start at the end of the last decade, we're going to, by 2020, be an industry with more than 30 billion pounds of private capital deployed, an industry that has more than 10 gigawatts of projects installed, that provides enough clean green electricity for eight million homes in the UK, that supports tens of thousands of high quality, high paid jobs, and an industry that while doing all that has somehow managed to take a third out of its cost. So we are absolutely an industry that is delivering on its promises. Um, and I think when you, when you look forward you have to see a very bright future for offshore wind, um, especially here in the UK. And one of the reasons I say that is because I think whichever way you look at the energy market in the UK, the UK needs offshore wind. There's, you know, there's no other option. Um, and there's probably two main reasons why you would say that. One is on the issue of climate change. So if you look forward to how the UK wants to address climate change, so on the one hand, um, control global warming to less than two degrees, on the other hand, meet growing energy demands. Uh, the only way to do that is to electrify your economy and decarbonize your electricity sector. So switch as much as possible of um, agricultural processes, industrial processes, transport heat onto electric sources and produce that electricity from low carbon sources. So offshore wind, being an industry producing massive quantities of clean green energy, is an obvious player in that mix. 
But even if you don't care about that, even if you don't believe in climate change, even if you think climate change was invented by the Chinese to sell wind turbines, there's another very strong argument, and it's simply this. The UK needs offshore wind to keep its lights on. The UK is due to shut down 40% of its electricity generation infrastructure by 2024. So if you factor in growing energy demands, probably between now and the middle of the next decade, the UK has to rebuild half of its electricity generation infrastructure and has to invest about £100 billion in order to do that. Now, it has options how to do it, but if you look at those options, coal has already been ruled out. Nuclear could very well be part of the future mix, but even the most enthusiastic supporter of nuclear won't try and convince you that you'll have new nuclear power stations online by 2025. Gas is a very strong option, but of course gas brings with it issues about security of supply because of imported gas and also issues um, around volatile costs. Onshore renewables has a massive part to play, but will it really get the scale you need to keep the lights on in this country? So when you peel it all back, offshore wind has to be a massive part of the energy mix in this country. And if you look at how policy has emerged, I think we've always been quite quietly but quite steadfastly supported by the UK government for that reason. Because whether it's climate change, whether it's security of supply, whether it's system stability, offshore wind is ticking all the boxes. But there's always been two qualifications to the support. One is we have to drive up industrial benefit, UK jobs, and the other is we have to drive down cost. And there's always been these basic two conditions to the continuing support for our sector. But the great news is that all the evidence is suggesting that we are addressing both of those issues. On cost, there's clear evidence now that offshore wind is dramatically reducing its cost. If you look at what's been happening in Europe with the various auction processes over the past couple of years, you've got projects in Holland um, which are going to be built at prices between 50 and 70 euros, Denmark 50 to 60 euros. You've even got projects in Germany, quite recently, where two big players in this industry, Dong and ENBW, felt comfortable enough with the evolution of cost that they took the strategic bet that by the middle of the next decade they could build those projects without any level of subsidy whatsoever. So costs are coming down. And even in the UK we can see that. Earlier this year we published the Cost Reduction Monitoring Framework. So that's a report produced by the Catapult for the Offshore Wind Programme Board, which I chair. Um, and really, that, that, that framework was designed to track the UK's progress towards its target of £100 by 2020. Uh, and in the recent uh, report that we published, what we showed was that in the period 2015-16, the average price of offshore wind in the UK was only £97. So we hit the £100 target four years ahead of the expected date. And those of us who were in the industry in 2011 when that, that target was set thought that target was going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to achieve. And yet here we are, four years early, hitting the target. And the good news is, when you look at the study, which is telling you how we're achieving that cost reduction, bigger turbines, increased competition, bigger scale, lower costs of capital, when you look forward, we're going to see more of the same, more progress on those same issues. So actually, all the indications are that costs will continue to come down. And that's highly significant. I think in, in later this year, a couple of months, we're going to see another CFD auction in uh, the UK. My company isn't participating in that process, so I can quite confidently make some statements about what might happen. But I, I think it's entirely um, within expectations that the price that wins that auction will be cheaper than the price is being offered to new nuclear, and probably even than the price that you would need to build new gas. Now, that's the significant thing about this cost reduction. It's not that we can all feel very smug about hitting a target four years early. That's irrelevant. What is relevant is that with this level of cost reduction, we are showing that offshore wind is now the lowest cost, large scale, low carbon generating technology. So if you want to decarbonize the electricity sector, you need more offshore wind, not less. The more offshore wind you have, the cheaper it will be to decarbonize the sector. And that's the powerful message that we can now give out because of all this progress that we're making on cost. Thanks to that message, offshore wind is no longer seen as the problem. 
It's the solution. It's no longer seen as a threat. It is a massive opportunity. And the opportunity is not just in relation to cost reduction. Offshore wind also represents a massive industrial opportunity. Now, right now, everything you're reading in the media, everything to do with politics is dominated by Brexit, the post-Brexit economy, the post-Brexit world. And it, it doesn't matter what you think about that, whether you're happy about that or not. The fact is that you, what you have to acknowledge is that this country has a lack of diversification in its economy. Its economy is very service sector focused and it's very concentrated on big cities, London, Manchester, Leeds, Edinburgh, etc. And what you probably saw in the Brexit vote was a lot of post-industrial towns and coastal communities crying out for some kind of change, some kind of rebalance of the economy. And that really has been driving government policy since that vote. That's why the government has become so focused on industrial strategy. Benj is going to talk about industrial strategy in a minute, so I'm not going to steal any of his thunder. Um, but when you look at industrial strategy, when you look at the priorities of industrial strategy, you can pretty much see that offshore wind is relevant to every one of those priorities. But the one in particular that I'm going to talk about is number nine, driving growth across the whole country. Because what's really interesting about what we do is we are spreading economic opportunity to parts of the country that are typically left outside of the economic mainstream. If you look at the places where offshore wind is happening, places like Barrow, places like Lowestoft, Great Yarmouth, Hartlepool, Hull, Teesside, Tyneside, Grimsby, these are actually places that all voted to leave the EU. Um, all, look at other places that need economic activity, Glasgow, Belfast, Macrahanish, these are all places which are benefiting from offshore wind. If you look on the map here, this is a map to do with the East Anglia 1 project, so one of our projects in Scottish Power. When we started working on this project, we set a target of 50% UK content. Uh, we're now able to say we have surpassed that target. So we've managed to uh, place all the co major contracts for this project, secure everything we needed in line with the programme, do it at the cost we needed to do it at, and all the while we've managed to grow the level of UK content to beyond 50%. And if you look at the map, what's interesting, the illustration here, is it's the places around these coastal communities that are getting these big contracts. And it's not just East Anglia 1 that's doing that. I mean, look at what's happening in the turbine sector. You've got Siemens with their factory in Hull. You've got Vestas with a factory in the Isle of Wight. You've got CS Wind producing towers in Macrahanish. In the structural sector, you've got Bifab in Fife. You've got Babcock in Rosyth. You've got activity in Teesside with OSB and Tyneside with Smulders in Lowestoft with SLP. You've got JDR exporting cables all over the world from Hartlepool. You've got installation contractors like MPI and Teesside and CJAX in Great Yarmouth. You've got other smaller companies getting into the sector like Hutchison's in Liverpool making secondary steel, like um, Sparrow in Granada making cranes. There are success stories starting to spread out all over this country thanks to offshore wind. And that's the really exciting thing about what we are doing. We are moving in the direction of society and we are helping to rebalance the economy in a way that other pits of the economy would find it very hard to do. So here we are, we are decarbonising the electricity sector, we're helping to fight climate change, we're keeping the lights on, we're reducing costs, we're spreading economic, economic opportunity, but yet nobody really outside of our sector knows or cares about what we do because somehow we are failing to get those messages out. And I find that amazing because here in the UK, we absolutely love big infrastructure. We love heavy industry. We love innovation. We love economic success stories. And that's exactly what we are, but yet people don't notice us. So I think that's something we all need to take responsibility for is spreading the word, telling anyone that will listen that we are an industry that delivers its promises. We are an industry that is helping to keep the lights on, to fight global warming, in the lowest cost possible way. We're an industry spreading economic, economic opportunity. We're an industry rebalancing the economy. We're an industry of pioneers, an industry of innovators. So we need to get the message out there that we are the offshore wind sector and this is what we offer to this country. And I think it's people like us that have to be 
the ambassadors for the industry and help us get those messages out. So we all have a big role to play, but I also think we have a big future together in this offshore wind industry in the UK. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, our second speaker, Ben Sykes, is presenting on the role of offshore wind in the context of the UK government's industrial strategy and developing a sector deal for offshore wind. Benj is UK country manager and head of program asset management in Dong Energy's offshore wind business. After setting up the asset management business with P&L responsibility for their operational wind farms across Northwest Europe, he now works on the company's extensive portfolio of pre-operational assets. He also co-chairs the Offshore Wind Industry Council. Ben's joined Dong Energy from the Carbon Trust where he led the company's technology innovation activities. And previously, Benj worked in the upstream oil and gas industry, most recently at Hess Corporation. Now, it's very important, as Jonathan has already said, that the potential for offshore wind to support the UK's ambitions to improve living standards and drive economic growth across the country is fully understood and enabled. And that is what Benj and his colleagues at the Offshore Wind Industry Council have been working hard to achieve. So, please join me in welcoming Benj Sykes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you uh, for that introduction, Pat, much appreciated. Um, I decided, rather than talk about Dong Energy's activities in offshore wind, which would perhaps be a little bit of repeat of uh, some of the uh, stories and some of the messages you've heard from Jonathan uh, and what Scottish Power is up to, I thought it might be interesting to talk a little bit today about the industrial strategy. Jonathan mentioned it. Uh, and I think it was very helpful the way you positioned the, uh, the sector, Jonathan, in terms of offshore wind being uh, absolutely central to the UK's future energy system. Uh, offshore wind has a, a history of looking at itself, figuring out how offshore wind can uh, build scale in the UK and globally, how the UK's offshore wind industry can create an industrial base on the back of uh, building uh, offshore wind farms, but I think we're moving to a new era now where we need to stop thinking just about what offshore wind is going to do, but we need to look much more broadly at where the energy system of the UK is heading and what role offshore wind can and should play in that. So what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, 10 minutes or so is just uh, give you a little bit of an introduction to what's going on in terms of the Offshore Wind Industry Council, who we are, what we do, and then talk about the industrial strategy and the sector deal that uh, we're working hard to bring forward to government over the coming months. So what is the Offshore Wind Industry Council? Some of you may be familiar with us. Um, industry councils were established maybe five, six years ago by the government of the time. The intention was to bring a stronger partnership between government and industry in key sectors for the UK economy. And there were around about 10 or 12 sectors that were identified and uh, thankfully, offshore wind at the time, uh, an emerging technology was seen as a sector that the government wanted to support, wanted to back, wanted to work closely with to drive industrialization, to drive the industry forward and make sure that the UK economy could take the benefits of this emerging sector. What are the priorities for the Industry Council? Well, delivering economic growth, Jonathan's mentioned that, delivering long-term, high-quality jobs. And as Jonathan has said, and, and I'll talk in a little while, offshore wind is uniquely placed as an industry to deliver those jobs in the parts of the UK, right around the coast, right around England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, uh, in places where the economy isn't working as well as it, uh, as it should do and as it can do. Uh, and we've heard the Prime Minister talk about an economy that works for all. Well, offshore wind is placed probably better than any other sector to deliver on that challenge for the UK. Secondly, we need to build a competitive supply chain. And uh, we'll talk about that a bit later. The UK has been very successful at building capacity in certain areas of the supply chain for offshore wind. But we're moving now to a new world where the UK's offshore wind industry is not only 
building capability to support the UK's offshore wind growth, but it's starting to export. We, uh, I'm sure we'll hear from uh, Matthew about what's happening from Hull. We know there's export from JDR. We know there's export going all around the world from, from a number of new and uh, established players in the offshore wind supply chain in the UK. So building a competitive supply chain that not only serves the UK but is internationally competitive and building exports is a second key strand for the Industry Council. And as Jonathan has said, driving costs down. So we are not there yet. We are rapidly approaching the point where we will be uh, the most attractive form of large-scale generation for the future power system, and that's a key driver for where the Industry Council wants to take this sector. But we're not there yet. We will see, I'm sure, interesting outcomes in the auction. Uh, unlike Jonathan, I'm not going to comment on where the uh, second uh, CFD auction round may, may end, uh, but it's certainly uh, we're on a strong downward trajectory on costs and an even faster downward trajectory on the level of support that projects need in the future. Who's in the Industry Council? Well, it's made up uh, of government. It's led by the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, BASE, as was formed uh, in 2015. Scottish Government is in there, the Department for International Trade, and, of course, the Offshore Renewables Catapult, who we'll uh, hear from a little bit later from Andrew. It's then made up from the industry side of the main developers. Uh, you, you'll see the names there, all active in the UK, um, with projects either live or coming forward, and some l of the larger players in the supply chain. And the intention of this mix is to make sure that we have voices in the room that understand both the opportunities and the challenges of the industry and can work together to drive, uh, drive the industry forward in terms of driving costs down, building the supply chain, and creating the jobs that I mentioned earlier. The, the membership evolves. Uh, so you can expect this to change over the coming months and years. Where does the industry, how does the Industry Council get anything done? Well, frankly, Jonathan does, does, the, does the work. He mentioned the Offshore Wind Programme Board. The Programme Board sits underneath the Council and is funded by the Council members. Uh, and the Offshore Wind Programme Board is where work really gets done. As you can see, there are three main strands there in terms of cost reduction, in terms of what are the barriers to future deployment, and how do we build the UK supply chain with cross-cutting themes of skills, innovation, finance, and grid uh, in those conversations. So Jonathan is overseeing a programme of work in the programme board. The members of the programme board are, again, uh, government, developers, supply chain, and other key stakeholders, whether they're statutory consultees in the environments and consenting side, uh, whether they're regulators such as Ofgem. We bring all the right players into these conversations to make sure we can find solutions to the barriers uh, and grasp opportunities as they come forward. These are the challenges. I'm not going to dwell on them. They'll all be familiar. Um, so, actually, in, in interest of time, I'm just going to jump ahead to the industrial strategy. So, the Industry Council, as I say, has been running for about uh, five or six years. Uh, it, it was born out of uh, government policy, but also it was uh, an evolution of what was called the Cost Reduction Task Force, I think it was called. Is that right, Andrew? Yes. Which Andrew led, uh, and that was what led to um, the ambition to reach £100 a megawatt hour for projects taking investment decisions in 2020, which, as Jonathan has said, we have uh, dramatically uh, over-delivered on four years early. But the, uh, the focus now for the Industry Council is, is very much on taking the opportunity that the new industrial strategy uh, offers to our sector. You will, I presume, have seen the green paper that was published in late January. Uh, that's created a real opportunity for us to work with government to take this industry to the next level uh, and to build a future that is perhaps more ambitious uh, and more of a game changer than, than we would otherwise have been able to achieve. There are two main themes to the work we're doing on industrial strategy. One is to build on our successes, and you've seen across those three key measures of supply chain, of jobs, and of cost reduction, we're, we're ahead of the curve on those. We are delivering UK content in our projects. We're starting to see exports from the supply chain. We're seeing jobs growth right around the UK, and particularly, as, as we've heard, in those areas of the UK where the economy isn't thriving. 
So that is all happening and we need to work with government to, to find ways to accelerate those outcomes. But secondly, and perhaps more excitingly, we're also looking at what are the game-changing opportunities for this sector. How do we realize a much bigger scale of ambition for the sector through the kinds of uh, system-level uh, growth and development that, that will enable offshore wind to become a much more central part of our energy system? There are 10 pillars to the, offshore, to the, sorry, to the industrial strategy which uh, was published in January. Jonathan's mentioned them. We believe as an industry we are delivering on all of them. Of course, every industry is telling government that they're delivering on all 10, so there's perhaps nothing surprising there. But there are some where the offshore wind industry is particularly well placed. We know that we're, we are driving innovation uh, and research and development, both through the catapult and also through universities um, and through it, the innovation community in the UK. Critically, we are delivering affordable energy and we're enabling the decarbonising of the UK economy more and more affordably. Uh, that is an outcome that government is very focused on and it's one that we are, uh, frankly, over-delivering on compared to where anyone believed we would be in 2017. And thirdly and crucially, we are creating new businesses, creating new high-growth industries, high-growth sector companies that are popping up all over the UK and also seeing sectors, uh, industries moving across from, for example, oil and gas uh, and, and other sectors to start working the offshore wind space. And that is driving growth in the economy right across the UK. So we are particularly strong in a number of these pillars of the industrial strategy and those are the ones we're going to focus on. So what are we trying to do? Well, my ambition, and we had a, a meeting earlier today to, with, with some of the key members of the sector to progress this, was to deliver a step change in scale of this industry. And I haven't put any numbers on the slide, but uh, I'm talking about potentially 50, 60, 70, 80 gigawatts of offshore wind in the UK. There's, with the way costs are going and with the way the industrial supply chain is growing, that is an ambition that we should strive for, but it doesn't come without its challenges. If we can meet those challenges, we can put offshore wind at the, at the very heart of the UK's 21st century energy system. We see increasing demand for electricity as we decarbonise transport and heat. We see a huge opportunity to put offshore wind uh, on a trajectory that's previously not really been contemplated for the UK. In the interest of time, I won't talk about building on our successes, but in terms of game changers, what are we looking at? Well, we're looking at driving innovation, we're looking at integrating with other technologies and particularly things like storage, things like demand-side response. So we're very much approaching this not as an offshore wind question, but as a system level question. How do we work with the rest of the UK's system uh, parties, if you like, stakeholders, to make sure that we can build uh, an energy system that can, uh, can absorb the amount of energy, the amount of power that 50, 60, 70 gigawatts of offshore wind could deliver. That does require a lot of engagement across a number of different agencies. It's not just the industry talking to itself. We have to work with those that manage and regulate the grid. We have to develop policy frameworks that support this. We have to work on te new technologies, not just for driving down the cost of offshore wind, but tackling challenges such as storage, such as demand-side response and so on. We also, in, on that journey, need to figure out how we deliver the skills that will be needed to make this a success for the UK, not just for the power system, but also for UK PLC in terms of jobs. So it's a very ambitious sector deal that we're looking to put into place, but we have an opportunity as an industry on the back of the success that Jonathan's talked about over the last five, six, seven years to put the offshore wind sector right at the heart of the UK's power system and build a world-leading, low-cost, low-carbon power system. Uh, and, of course, on the back of that, build a very strong export uh, story so that we can build, uh, build the UK sector into a world-leading sector. I just listed here some of the things we might want to talk about in the, in the session as we uh, get into Q&A. This raises some big questions, as I said, around system, around grid, around innovating in the sector and more broadly across other sectors and critically of course how do we build those high growth uh, industries those high growth businesses that will be at the heart of the uk reaping the harvest 
uh, of a very scaled up offshore wind industry. So it's early days, we're just embarking on this. The uh, slight curved ball of the election means we're not quite sure who we're talking to. In, well, there isn't a government, but when there is a government, we'll, we'll find out who it is that we should talk to to progress this. But it's a real opportunity, and I guess if there's one message to take away, it's that offshore wind has turned a corner. This is no longer a conversation about how can offshore wind grow. It's about how can the energy system of the 21st century be transformed by the success that offshore wind is already delivering. Thank you. Some very interesting comments there from Benj, and I'm sure we'll come back to a number of these points when we get to the, the questions and indeed uh, in some of the comments from others on the panel. Um, I'm now going to ask uh, three more very well-known industry figures to share some of their thoughts and ideas on cost reduction and industrialization in the offshore wind sector. Uh, and they're just going to give us a few minutes each. Uh, I'll introduce them all first and then invite Hoop to, to start us off. So first of all, we have Hoopden Royan, Director of Energy, Minerals and Infrastructure at the Crown Estate, who leads the team responsible for managing the natural resources of the seabed, including infrastructure, minerals and aggregates, and offshore wind. Hoop joined the Crown Estate in March 2012 and has over 30 years' experience in the energy sector, predominantly working with Shell. While at Shell, he was jointly responsible for creating its wind energy business in 1997 and managed its first offshore wind projects including the first offshore turbines in the UK in 2000 and the first offshore wind farm in the Netherlands in 2006. Prior, prior to moving to renewables, he worked in oil and gas in The Hague, Houston and London. Andrew Jimison is chief executive of the offshore renewable energy catapult, which is a technology and innovation center supporting businesses to accelerate the design, deployment and commercialization of renewable energy technology. Andrew was previously at Scottish Power, where he was responsible for energy policy and regulation in the renewables business. He sits on the Scottish Government's Energy Advisory Board, is a past chair of Renewable UK and Scottish Renewables, and has led a number of reports for the government, including, as mentioned, the Cost Reduction Task Force for Offshore Wind in 2012. Matthew Knight is the Director of Energy Strategy and Government Affairs for Siemens PLC. Siemens provides a range of technologies and services for fossil and renewable electricity generation and transmission, onshore and offshore. Siemens is also involved in finance and development of offshore wind. Uh, Matthew has a background in electricity projects and offshore wind farms. He's a board member of Renewable UK and a member of the Energy Policy Panel of the Institution of Engineering and Technology. So I will hand over to Hub, first of all, and I think our, our panel members are going to just stay at their seats for this session. So thank you very much, Pat, for that introduction. Um, and um, energizing and electrifying the economy, I certainly get electrified listening to Jonathan and Benj about the fantastic opportunity that is awaiting us. I'd like to make um, three uh, brief points um, on all of this. I think one, just emphasizing, which you would expect from us as Crown Estate, that yes, we do have the world's very best offshore wind resource here in the UK. And um, we are making great strides in unlocking its potential. The second point is that we are, our society is going through a technology transformation that hasn't seen its equal since uh, Newcomen uh, invented the first atmospheric machine back uh, in the day. And the digitization and the electrification of our societies is unstoppable. Here's a little factoid that surprised me when I read it over the weekend. The global CO2 emissions from aviation, from the aviation sector, are now less than the CO2 emissions from data servers that we all use our phones and our search engines for. And we are only starting to create the digital world. So the demand for electricity and as a result, the imperative on doing that in a low carbon way uh, is um, unstoppable. Now, um, we have heard about 
cost reduction in offshore wind. We've also heard Bench talk about the absolute need to take a system-wide perspective because this is not about a single technology. It is about evolving the way that we in society deal and consume energy and electricity, the way it is traded, the way it is paid for, the way it is valued. Um, so offshore wind's story going forward is very much a systems story. How does the UK's, how does the world's energy system evolve? I think the third point I would like to make is on um, transparency. And it's sometimes easy to forget how large the scale of these projects is. Um, could I just see a hands up of anyone who has ever been offshore in a wind farm? And that's great, because you understand how huge, how large these facilities are. And they will get ever more larger. The journey has just begun, as we have heard. And, the, uh, and that growth will only continue if the performance is reliable, if the interaction with uh, the ecological system, with the natural environment is acceptable. Uh, we are creating huge infrastructure projects in areas that are also occupied by um, uh, fellow species on the planet and having a great degree of transparency and being on the front foot in the dialogue with environmental organizations is critical to demonstrate that these facilities can be benign as well as low carbon. And that's something that the sector um, is, uh, is closely taking to heart and we will have to deal with um, even even, even further when the sector grows. As Jonathan said, we are a very successful sector, but people don't notice us. I think there is something here also about that transparency to demonstrate what actually offshore wind is contributing to the energy system, both uh, in terms of its electricity and its wider social and environmental benefits. And that is also something that you will hear much more from us. And on the back of those three points, I also believe that there are tremendous economic opportunities, specifically here in the UK, because we are the world leader in terms of installed capacity, with almost 2,300 operating offshore wind turbines or under construction. All of those will need very tender love and care over a lifetime that can easily uh, exceed uh, 20, 25, maybe 30 years and providing tremendous opportunities for businesses here to hone their skills in making sure that these assets can be operated safely and responsibly throughout their life. And I really look forward to seeing the industry continue to grow now that we have turned the corner to becoming um, a, uh, a part of the energy system. Thanks, Thank you. Andrew. Thank you. Um, when you're speaking at conferences like this a few years ago, when the biggest challenge to the industry, bar none, was, was cutting costs uh, and, and proving that this was an industry that had the right to exist and generate and, and so on, um, I always used to highlight that, uh, to my mind, the cost reductions were achievable, but you had this triangle to overcome. And on each point of the triangle, you had government, you had the developer owners, and you had the supply chain. And the government would go to the developer owners saying, we want prices to be cheaper, the developers would go to the supply chain saying we want you to sell stuff to us more cheaply, the supply chain would go back up the triangle and say we'll guarantee us orders and then the developers would go back to the government saying make the planning more robust so as we can have all have confidence. And I used to argue that the only way to overcome this was for us all to move into the centre of the triangle, it wasn't for any one particular player in that three-way pact to bring success around. And I think what my colleagues have highlighted is that's what's been happening. We've jointly worked through better ways to gain confidence in the sector. And if you look at what's happening in, in Europe in particular and at even cheaper prices than anyone had imagined, I think there's been a very strong pact of coming into the centre of that triangle. It's well worth 
uh, deeper analysis of all of those things. But we have, as a result, made tremendous progress on costs. Uh, it's very visible. We're making tremendous progress on jobs and the growth in jobs and the quality of the jobs that go in it, and high-tech jobs, which I'm very, very pleased about. Um, but I have a let's not stand still message. Um, if we stand still, we'll get outcompeted by whichever other technology types might come around. Um, so I still have challenges for everybody about learning, collaboration. Collaboration is very difficult in a competitive environment, but we have to explore where are the horizontal collaborations that we can bring in where possible, but also for developers and supply chain, more deep understandings on vertical collaboration. And I, if I look at my Catapult and Catapult colleagues who are in the manufacturing space and who, who then deal more directly with the aerospace and automotive sectors, uh, that's where they see. They see stronger linkages, I think, than we've achieved yet in our sector on being able to collaborate, to take the technologies ever and ever forwards in ways that no one had imagined. You may have seen in the manufacturing space, there's this digital industrial revolution, digital 4.0 coming around, where we're digitizing all our processes. And that ultimately means more information, more data is available for deeper analysis about how to do things better. That revolution is going to come to our sector and propel us yet further forwards, and, our, and again in ways that I don't think we have begun to imagine. What, what will it mean for the development processes with all this environmental data out there, which is competitive? But ultimately, if we put it all together, it could be collaborative and we might be able to free up a lot more projects in faster ways. As a potential example, I'm just throwing it out there of changes that we might come around. We've got to have this innovation continually driving our sector forwards, taking the costs ever downwards, providing stronger economic growth both locally uh, and then for the, the export market. Um, so I'm very pleased the government is about to bring in uh, a new thing called an innovation hub. We've got a website that the Catapult will be driving behind that innovation hub. I think it's going to launch the next day or two. And that will help focus where are the priorities for government funding uh, against where industry needs are for innovation in the future. And how can we show government that any money that comes from government is going to have the biggest impact uh, for any money that government is spending for the bettering of our industry overall. So we've got to keep innovating. We've got to keep thinking new ways of doing things, better ways of doing things, safer ways of doing things, longevity of the plant that goes in the water, stronger competitivity, and ultimately exporting. I think those goals we all absolutely share. My colleagues are absolutely right. On the systems front, air offshore wind is going to be a major player. What will it mean ultimately for the consumer thinking about where their electricity is coming from? Do I want to have an electric car because I know this stuff is really clean as opposed to uh, any other transport choices we have in the future. Um, you may be aware the Carapult owns an offshore wind turbine, one turbine, but it's here in Scotland in, in methyl. We call it the leave and mouth turbine. We're using that for research purposes. Uh, on, on straightforward engineering things like turbulence and impacts on, uh, uh, on blades and so on and foundations and also the use of drone technology for inspections. But wider than that, we're working with Fife Council and other partners to look at if you're integrating wind power and, and offshore wind power and other technology choices such as storage or hydrogen, what does it mean for the consumer ultimately? And what does it mean for local authorities planning around all of these uh, technology choices in the future? Um, because we're moving to a very, very cleaner and different economy in the future. So I'm going to come back to my triangle point. We're not quite at the middle yet. And even if we are in the middle, we need to stay in the middle of the triangle. We need to keep working very strongly across the public sector and everything else that sits within the private sector. But progress to date, fantastic. Opportunities ahead, incredible, incredible. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Matthew. Well, good morning, everybody. I, I wasn't expecting to come next, but uh, that's OK. Um, uh, I've been struck by the words ambition and uh, vision. And um, thanks very much to the, the, the guys in the AV box. Can you put up the picture? This is something that I was tweeted uh, five minutes before this session started, and that's a photograph taken yesterday in Hull, uh, and you can see not one, but two jack-up vessels loading up for two different projects to take uh, wind turbines for, uh, offshore. That is a massive um, justification 
of some ambition uh, and some vision that was had by a few people a few years ago. If you remember back to the days when uh, Siemens and uh, you may have noticed that uh, I, I now work for a separate company, so I can I can commend Siemens Gamesa for this. It's uh, it's no longer the company that uh, that uh, I work with; it's a sister company. Um, when Siemens took the decision to build that facility, it was not clear what the future of the offshore wind industry was. It was not clear how fast the costs would come down. It was far from clear. In fact, it was very worrying how long the government might support the industry. Uh, but the ambition wasn't, well, let's build something small and have a go. The ambition was, let's build 600 metres of dockside so we can get three vessels in at one time. Uh, so seeing two of them in there uh, when the site is not even fully up and running is, uh, is, is a, great, uh, a great thing. Now, what happens next? We've got a small election going on at the moment. Straight after the election, there'll be a reshuffle. Then there'll be some ministers in place. The ministers will be um, probably entirely ignorant uh, of energy uh, and the complex interrelated nature of uh, energy. Uh, they'll, they'll have to struggle to, uh, to get on top of a few things. But within about three months, they will have to set the position for this government for the next five years. So there's a really important moment for our industry uh, in that three months following the election to get across something of the scale uh, and something of what we can do for this country. Uh, and that's important for all of you in this room, uh, not just the, um, the, 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 the six of us sort of pale male, stale uh, representatives here. Thank we you. need the whole diverse, um, extensive offshore wind community to be banging home the message uh, that this industry is now really fundamental to the future power supply of, uh, of this country. Um, we need to move on, um, not, uh, you know, we, we used to be sort of apologetic about how much can we be allowed to build, and we need to change that to how do we design the rest of the power system to work with the wonderful um, low cost, low carbon, uh, job creating opportunity that offshore wind is in the UK. Um, we also need to move on from trying to measure how much UK content do we have in UK projects to how much of a share of the global growing offshore wind market can the UK win alongside Denmark and alongside Germany. Uh, let's have a bigger cake and win a good share of it. Uh, we need to uh, set our sights differently. One other thing we need to do in the very short term um, the government does support our industry, but while they're distracted by Brexit, while they're distracted by an election, there's a danger of benign neglect. And we just need to get across to government that when they set the budget uh, for how much offshore wind should be done in the next few years, um, we told them it wasn't sufficient to build a big enough UK supply chain. We've actually been able to deliver more for less uh, and the message really needs to go to government in the short term, uh, don't cut the budget because we've cut the cost. Allow us to build more and then the country will reap the rewards. Thanks very much. Thank you. <clears throat> so thanks to Hoop, Andrew and Matthew for their um, thoughts and ideas. Now, if the presentation so far have not provoked thought and stimulated plenty of questions in your minds, Perhaps our last contribution will do. Um, Andrew Reid, President of Consulting at Westwood Global Energy Group, will now present to us Westwood's offshore wind market forecast out to 2025. Andrew began his career with an oil field services firm before joining investment banker Simmons & Company as an equity analyst focused on European oil services. This was followed by a number of years with Ernst & Young, where he specialised in energy industry mergers and acquisition work in addition to valuations, strategic reviews, and corporate development projects. He joined the board of Douglas Westwood in 2007 and took over as CEO in 2009. More recently, and post the acquisition of Douglas Westwood by the Westwood Global Energy Group in 2016, he assumed the role of president of consulting for the global business. Please join me in welcoming Andrew.
Okay, uh, thank you, Pat, for the kind introduction, and uh, good morning, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, today, conscious of time, we'll run through as quickly as I can uh, a number of themes. You know, we'll look to, I suppose, accumulate this formal part of uh, the presentation session with uh, the Douglas Westwood and Westwood Global Energy outlook uh, with regard to future investment and activity within uh, the offshore side. And I'll pick up on a number of the themes which have already been relayed th this morning and I suppose give, give our viewpoints as to how this cumulatively influences investment and the future uh, uh, opportunity, I, I suppose, for, for this market. But as far as, you know, who are Westwood, um, ordinarily we'd put in a slide here, you know, championing our, our wares, but it's probably more important than ever right now. You know, the Westwood Global Energy Group is a relatively new entity. It's only come into being over the first quarter of this year. You know, what is it? Well, it's a, a research and consulting uh, firm, you know, focusing on providing market intelligence and commercial insight to the energy sector. You know, we cover upstream, midstream, down, and uh, power gen, but you know, you're perhaps more familiar with our, our previous trading names such as Douglas Westwood, but we've also you know, come into play with, with Richmond Energy Partners, Hannon Westwood, Novas Energy, and JSI. So you know, we're a far bigger firm uh, looking to, to broaden our, our research and uh, I suppose ultimate influence in, in the energy sector. You know, we're a global business with uh, uh, presence across all the major continents and our clients are predominantly exploration and production, upstream oil and gas co's, oil field services, utilities, government and financial. This uh, executive summary or introduction slide is actually my conclusion slide as well. So if anybody's really struggling, you can fall asleep after you hear this one uh, because you'll see it again at the end. But, you know, just to kind of put some tangible numbers to much of the, the views and themes that have come out of uh, the other panelists' uh, conversations, you know, we're expecting that uh, capacity is going to increase almost five-fold uh, between now and 2025 with 62 gigawatts of, of additions coming through. That is inclusive of China, which is obviously a really uh, quite material um, uh, territory, but cumulatively, you know, just shy of 300 billion euros uh, will be spent in that time. Macro fundamentals are in place, and I would say they're getting stronger. I'll come on and I'll dwell a bit on that, that uh, just in a moment. You know, we've seen increased turbine efficiency. You know, that's been partly responsible for, for driving cost reduction, so much so that we're now in a place where offshore wind, you know, is becoming increasingly compatible on a cost basis to that of fossil fuels, and certainly is on a trajectory to have lower costs and, and be very competitive with onshore wind and traditional gas-fired uh, generation. When we look at, you know, where's the money being spent? It's still here in Europe, you know, predominantly in the UK and, and Germany, uh, and collectively, you know, about 70% of that activity, that investment will, will be centered here uh, through to 25. Very busy slide. I can barely read the content um, on the screen here, so I dare say that you guys are, are struggling. Um, but I'll speak to you know a number of the themes from the macro side, which I think are, are pivotal to uh, you know underpinning our, our forecast going forward. On the energy demand side, we all know that you know as we see increased industrialization, increased urbanization, particularly in brick economies, you know historically. A compound growth rate of just over 2% has been exhibited uh, as far as energy demand is concerned. You know, we expect a, a similar trajectory um, going forward. When you look at the security of supply, again, this was touched on earlier, but, you know, um, we, we've become addicted to fossil fuels, uh, hydrocarbon. You know, these are generally contained in territories, let's be honest, which uh, don't always exhibit the most political politically and economically uh, stable in environments. And, and so, you know, on the renewable side, uh, this, this offers, I suppose, alternatives uh, to, you know, gas disruptions and, and other such things, and also uh, countries to utilize their own natural resources over and beyond uh, that, that of hydrocarbon. We also have the emission targets, you know, the Paris Agreement, the environmental concerns, you know, we all know this is a far uh, lower carbon solution. 
Um, and on the subsidies side, yes, we've needed subsidies to stimulate, create the, this market, uh, this industry. But as we're increasingly seeing, the um, cost reduction, the scale of projects are, are starting to, to you know, allow this industry to stand in its own two feet. Production costs, again, um, you know, Jonathan made, made reference to the, you know, where we are in the UK, which is uh, put up there, but you know, we're becoming increasingly competitive, and I'll, I'll speak more about that. And I suppose this last piece about OPEX, CAPEX, is about scale. You know, this is a material industry. With materiality, with continuity, that prospers investment in the supply chain and across all of the stakeholder groups, which then allows for greater innovation, greater progress, greater efficiency. Again, you know, this has been mentioned already, but just to kind of bring this to life, some of the, the themes which underpin the, the evolution and the trajectory, I suppose, of, of the sector, you know, we're seeing for sure project scale increasing, you know, the capacity, water depth, distance from shore uh, has all been going in a, a sort of northerly direction. And, and I suppose fundamentally what, what lends itself to is that, you know, economies are, are being realized in, in spite of um, increased project complexity as this, you know, this sector, this industry matures or is on a maturing uh, trajectory. You know, again, we, we've heard a lot about the, the role of turbines and turbine size growth um, has, has been pivotal in, in supporting cost reduction. Um, you know, the capacity water depth distance from shore relative to early projects and that growth has, has been quite exponential. You know, when you consider your 0 0.05 of a megawatt back in 85, but even as we have come through this millennium, the, uh, the progress and, and the, this, the scale of, of, of the turbines, in addition to their um, the reliability uh, and, and so forth, has, has been very material. You know, we expect, obviously, that the number of turbines per wind farm will fall. You know, the foundations uh, will need to evolve and adapt for, for these, these larger um, facilities, but, but all in, over our forecast period, we're of the uh, opinion that, you know, circa 10,000 turbines uh, will be installed and around 70% of those um, will be 8 megawatts or more. And costs, you know, we've heard a lot about costs and the evolution of cost and the trajectory of cost. But fundamentally, yes, they, you know, they, they have come down, you know, why turbines and industrialization, uh, you might call it, you know, the market is competitive and we could, you know, be sub 50 euros per megawatt, you know, particularly if we see further evolution in, in turbine design uh, moving towards the 13, 15 megawatts. Now, you know, these are not coming out publicly. The turbine manufacturers are obviously very tight lipped about their uh, R&D programs, but, you know, the trajectory that we're on, you know, we're of the view and through other conversations that, you know, the, these are real and distinct possibilities, particularly as we enter the, the next decade. Relative to five years ago, you know, turbines are two, three times larger. Uh, you have increasing load factors. You also have project clustering, um, you know, which, which really helps drive economies. When you have large infrastructure being built in relatively close proximity, you know, you're getting that benefit of shared services such as the port facilities referenced earlier uh, and, and other such things. And of course, scale. Scale where, you know, I, I referenced earlier, we have constant projects now, you know, we have materiality, we, we have something, an, end, an industry, an sector, an outlook that, that businesses and organizations can, can really invest in and plan towards. You know, this helps with you know, manufacturing, having, you know, better capacities through through better planning. You know, all, all these factors just, just lead to greater efficiency and the ability to reduce cost. So coming back to, to the forecast, you know, it's a nice hockey stick chart. Um, and, you know, it demonstrates the cumulative capacity uh, between now and, and, and 25. You know, I've waxed lyrical already, I think, on, on many of these, these points. Um, but looking more specifically at where that's going to come from, uh, you can see that, you know, the UK, the UK dominates activity, you know, we, we are the leaders um, in this sector, you know, with just uh, about a third of, of expenditure 
plan to, to be focused in, a, in our own uh, backyard. As I mentioned earlier, 70% or so um, will be within Europe, and, and China is obviously a, a big growth area. That said, you know, in spite of the, the investment going into that, that region or territory, you know, I would be somewhat skeptical about the, the opportunity for, let's say, more OECD or Western businesses to, to prosper off the back of that. I expect it will become increasingly indigen, indigenous, if, if you like, as far as supply chain um, as, as, as that territory matures, let, let's call it. So, as promised, you've seen this slide before. Just to repeat, you know, there's significant growth here, significant capacity additions, significant investment. You know, it's an industry which can stand on its own two feet financially and economically and has, you know, robust fundamentals which support and underpin that, that growth. I think, you know, I would mirror many of the comments which were made earlier that there's a lack of awareness almost or a lack of belief at just how far the sector has grown, how, how well it is matured and how real an opportunity and stable a business environment this is. You know, we, as I'm sure many of us here, are hugely optimistic and, and very looking forward to, uh, to a, a bright future. Thank you. Right, some very interesting information there from Andrew. So, um, now I will open the floor for questions and comments. Um, please indicate in the usual way if you wish to ask a question or offer a view on what you've heard so far this morning. Uh, we do have a gentleman there with, with mics to bring to you, so please wait for him to reach you so that we can all hear the question or the comment. And if you could also uh, perhaps start by giving your name and organization, and please say if you are directing your question at one of our panel in particular. So, do we have any questions to kick us off? Okay. Hello. Hi there. Yep. This is uh, Tim Camp from DMV Gel. I, I'd like to uh, uh, agree with Ben, really, saying that uh, to really bring down the further costs of offshore wind and to generate extra value from offshore wind, we have to think of it as part of a system, uh, whether that's a concept of an offshore wind farm power station or offshore wind as part of the, the bigger UK grid system. I, 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 I want to ask you what do you think is the most important functionality that offshore wind brings to the system which will allow a more penetration and extra value from the system overall? Okay, thank, thanks for the question, Tim. Uh, and I certainly want to give a chance to, uh, to others to contribute. I think, I think it brings a number of things in terms of um, resilience. Uh, we don't, uh, it's relatively distributed. It's uh, very forecastable. And we know, uh, heard an interesting fact uh, today, and uh, I think it comes from a gentleman on, on the left end of the panel, that uh, uh, National Grid can forecast output from wind power better than it can forecast demand a day ahead. So we know it's, a, it's, it's, it's not dispatchable, but it is very forecastable. Uh, it also offers certain uh, facilities in terms of uh, ancillary services to the grid, and, and you know, I don't want to go into the technical details, but I think there are a number of things it brings forward. But I, I suppose I would flip it around a little bit and say, what are the, what, what are the enablers that will, ena will allow this sort of larger game-changing scale shift in offshore wind? And, and they are the technologies of storage, of demand-side response. And I think we, we already see significant progress just in the last small number of years in these areas. And uh, we, together with other sectors such as transport, the automotive sector, uh, I think can work together to drive a lot of these technologies to the point where we have uh, those barriers dealt with. Okay. Andrew, were you wanted to come in on that? No, I, I think Ben has answered extremely well, but I, I really like the location factor and the diversity and spread, geographic spread, um, both from the physical, practical aspects of landing it into the grid, um, but just the economic benefits that brings to jobs around the UK or elsewhere, fantastic. Okay. Matthew? 
Um, the future is not going to be the same as the past. And I think when people look at offshore wind, the counterfactual that they have is the way things are now. The whole of the grid is changing. Um, we're seeing supply businesses launching solar plus battery offerings to people. Uh, now, if you're paying 15 pence a kilowatt hour in your house, uh, you can spend quite a bit of money on something that takes you off the grid. Whereas if you're generating electricity at the other end of the system for the equivalent of four pence, um, you know, things are changing on the grid. And if I were sat at National Grid, one of the things that makes a grid continue to be worth having is actually having some large-scale um, base cost power. I think we need to move on from the idea of base load and think of offshore wind as the kind of the base cost large, when the wind's blowing, that's what's available and it's, you know, it's cheap and it's reliable. And we build a system around that that's got sufficient storage and flexibility and the other things that we need to make that work as a system. So I, I, it's, it's not about shoehorning a bit more wind into a system. It's about having a system that runs completely differently. Thank you, Matthew. Does anyone else want to come in on that uh, question? Okay. Um, any further questions? Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Charles Yates from CMY Consultants. Uh, it's a question for those who are willing to answer, um, and it is, how low can we go? Um, by which I mean, how low will the levelised cost of energy for offshore wind go, <coughs> either ultimately in the long term or perhaps more topically in the CFD auctions? Okay. Gentlemen, who's prepared to answer that question? <laughs> Shall I have a go? Um, I, I think it's one of those laws of economics that um, uh, it, it will get as low as it needs to be to beat everything else that is out there. Um, at which point um, government can shout and people can make pressure, but actually if you're the cheapest thing that's out there, then you can build as much as you like. Um, what are we going to be comparing it with, not in five years' time, but in 10 or 15 years' time? I don't know. Uh, and it's the whole system cost that we need to compare. Uh, but I think we're going to be you know, in a system that has a mix of flexible, uh, sort of some dispatchable, some non-dispatchable demand and generation, some storage and various other things. We, we, we need to be in amongst the mix. If I had to guess, in today's money, oh, it's got to be uh, of the order of, well, the, 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 the Westwood slide just now, sort of 50 pounds or dollars per megawatt hour is, is the sort of thing. But actually, we won't be paying by the megawatt hour. Um, we, electricity in 20 years' time will be paid for like broadband. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll pay for your connection, um, and um, you, you'll the the, uh, the marginal cost will be pretty low. Okay. Andrew, you wanted to come in? I was going to make a very similar point to Matthew about is this as competitive as it needs to be to compete and, and run, um, but I think the more relevant point is how quickly can the industry come off the need for any other tariff support beyond any kind of wholesale price. And I think the industry has got its eyes firmly set on that as a goal that could and should be achieved as quickly as possible. I think that will be the thing that becomes a real dynamic game changer for this industry in terms of the prospects of just how many gigawatt hours and volume that it, it can provide into the, the energy space. Hope? Yeah, I've got, oh, sorry. Right. Um, I think um, we also need to moderate our expectations maybe a little bit. I would observe that um, a lot of the resource sits quite far offshore and um, we are uh, developing operating models, construction models, which really haven't um, been tried at this scale before. So we are extrapolating eagerly because it is so enticing, but at the same time these uh, projects uh, are uh, risky projects. We are uh, already accounting for the successful deployment of technologies that haven't yet been prototyped. I mean, I can't point to any 12 megawatt prototype out there. And I read 
certain press statements that talk about 13 to 15 megawatt turbines will allow us to uh, build at zero subsidy. So I applaud the uh, risk appetite of those companies involved and I am sure that they make those statements on, on the basis of, of very good information. But uh, I would say please let us be careful that we don't um, uh, now assume that this will happen overnight. This is a long journey which will only happen if we continue <coughs> to invest in projects that um, uh, uh, will, will, will need to see technology evolve. So I think that's one point. I'd like to make a very brief second point, which is I think we are also, we should be aware how the rest of the energy system operates. There isn't a piece of generating equipment in this country at uh, the scale of let's say 100 megawatt plus that gets constructed without some form of government contract, whether it's through a capacity market for new gas-fired power generation, whether it's through a negotiated contract, if you want to build a new nuclear plant, or whether it is through a CFD contract in a competitive auction for renewables. So we are in a world where um, we have government effectively as a central buyer driving the investments that we make. And I think, therefore, that the question on cost is becoming a question that really should be seen in terms of value. What is the energy system that we wish to have? And uh, then it will be priced accordingly. And the price will be the right price. Okay. Andrew Reid, were you wanting to come in as well there? Yeah, I was just going to add that um, you know, there's a number of factors over and above the supply chain element. Um, you know, the cost of capital, you know, the returns for those uh, principals and stakeholders have come down. You know, there's, you know, I, I, I take your point, though, that, um, you know, we, we're, we're, we're basing, you know, quite significant cost reduction on a trajectory that, that we believe uh, we're on. And there's obviously quite a lot of work and, and risk to time and, and uh, achieving that. But, you know, I, I think that the trajectory to date has been phenomenal to to be honest and you know I, I think from our perspective we strongly believe that you have the right mix of, of macro and micro fundamentals which are hugely supportive um, of, of driving cost uh, and, and creating this this material standalone industry um, and I think that's that's the big change that I see particularly from three five years ago um, where, where it was still somewhat fledgling. Anyway. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else want to come in? Okay. Uh, there was another question. Lady here. Thank you. I'm Gillian Baker from Interterminals. Um, I just picked up the comment that the transmission losses for offshore wind um, were quite significant um, and growing as the farms move further offshore. I'd just be interested in the panel's thoughts on this um, and whether there's a risk to the industry if the uh, metering point moved from at source um, to the grid. Thank you. Uh, my background is building grid connections for offshore wind farms. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> there's sort of two ways of looking at that. If, you're, if your fundamental fuel cost is free, um, how do you calculate efficiency? Um, and, and what the losses mean. The, the economic uh, side of this is how much can you get paid for the electricity that you can generate? Uh, and I, I would certainly support the idea that actually you get paid for what you can, you can get to uh, the, the system uh, at the shore. Um, the losses that are often talked about uh, are the bit in the array, uh, in, in the array cables. When you uh, then step up to a higher voltage and you have to come to shore. Um, within, I don't know, 100 kilometers of the shore, you'll use AC and you're looking at losses of you know, a percent or so uh, to get that to the shore. Um, beyond that, you can then go to HVDC and then you're looking at losses of a percent or so, however far it is because you've moved to a different technology. Uh, and there the loss comes from the converting it to DC and converting it back again. So, in terms of the loss to get it to the mainland grid, it's around about 1% uh, 
which is not, in the scheme of things, a disaster. Um, and since you're not paying for the fuel to generate that, it's, um, it, it's, not, it's not a showstopper. Okay. Anyone else want to come in on that question? Okay, we have another question down at the front. Charles Thompson from ORE Catapult, and it was a question for Andrew Reid and then anyone else who wanted to come in. And Andrew, it was just picking up on one of the um, predictions in your analysis slide that suggested renewable sources to grow their share of the supply mix from 10% in 2016 to 17% by 2035. That struck me as being very, very low. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on where that sits in the graph we would need to be on to meet global carbon decarbonisation targets, um, where should we be? Okay, thank you. Um, as far as where we should be, I'm not entirely sure, but you know, why, why is it low? I, I think that the realities are we, we have a, a global environment, energy infrastructure, um, which you know, needs huge amounts of additional capital and investment and overhaul in, in which to be able to, you know, bring or allow us to, to achieve the targets that, that we're seeking um, globally. So, you know, history tells us um, that, you know, the, these things take longer, cost more um, than, than, they, uh, than they're expected to. I think while there's a, a desire um, to drive renewables more within the, the energy mix, um, you know, that needs to be balanced with, with some of the realities that competing um, arguments, the, the economics uh, and, you know, construction, finance risks and, you know, everything else that, that's involved. You know, we have an energy sector which is huge globally. We have an oil and gas and hydrocarbon sector which is hugely influential. Um, you know, number of, of plays there, you know, we, and we have political uh, variants, I, I suppose, with, with regard to will if you look at, you know, the US and, and other territories. So, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, we, we take a, or try and take a more realistic or sort of balanced view as to, to what may happen on that regard. Okay, Matthew? Um, predicting the future is a mugs game. Um, just in terms of answering the, uh, the, the, the first part of the question. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, no offence. Yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, none intended. Uh, no, well, uh, those of you who watched the um, Spencer Dale, who's the chief economist at BP, uh, did his annual presentation sort of next door to Bob Dudley uh, earlier in the year, uh, and he sort of introduced it by saying that he does an annual global energy forecast, and forecasts are always wrong, and energy doesn't change very much, so he's repeating himself, and he's going to be wrong. Um, <laughs> In his presentation, though, he actually had uh, increased his estimate for uh, the uh, quantity of renewable energy by 15% compared to his previous estimate a year before. So I look back, and a year before it had gone up another 15%. So BP's forecast for renewable energy has gone up 30% in two years. Um, if you compare the BP figures with, say, the Bloomberg figures, looking at the uh, expected rise of electric vehicles globally. Um, the BP view of the world is that um, electric vehicles will take off, but by, I forget the end of their forecast period, it might be the total of 2030s, something like that, they, they forecast something like 2% of all the vehicles in the world, and that might be several million vehicles would be electric vehicles. I don't buy that. I, I think there will come a moment, there'll be a tipping point, and nobody can quite predict when that tipping point is, but suddenly the obvious next car for you to buy will be electric. Um, the Bloomberg view of the world, um, that tipping point comes really quite soon. You might have seen last week, uh, oh, sorry, the week before, Tesla's share price, Tesla, a company that's never made a profit, uh, Tesla's share price, its, um, its, uh, its valuation now is greater than the Ford Motor Company, uh, and it was briefly greater than General Motors uh, for about half a day. Um, Ford is a highly profitable company that's been doing this for a hundred and something years and knows what it's talking about. Tesla is a young startup um, that is planning to ramp up its production of cars at a faster rate than 
uh, the US ramped up its aircraft production during the Second World War, and yet the stock market believes him. Um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to pinch uh, a bit from Michael Liebreich's uh, State of the Nation speech the other day, he said he's been, uh, he's been surprised by a couple of mega trends over the years. One of them was the rise of shale gas, and the other one was Elon Musk. Um, so, uh, you know, one man, one company is a mega trend on this. Can I answer the other part of the question, which was how fast do we need to do this? The best available science, uh, the IPCC reports and the various things that have come out of those, tells us that at the current rate of greenhouse gas production, in order to have a 60% chance of not exceeding one and a half degrees of uh, global warming, uh, we have four years left, and then we will have burnt all the carbon and released all the methane we can ever allow ourselves to burn to have a 60% chance of not breaching one and a half degrees. So the science is really clear, really scary, and a real imperative. But the good news is that some of the economics around tipping points for electric vehicles, cost reduction in photovoltaics, cost reduction in offshore wind, are making lots of the transition happen much faster than any of us thought was possible, but still not fast enough. Thank you, Matthew. Does anyone else want to come in on that question? Okay, we've got a question up at the back. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Mike Nuttall, owner of a company called Airglide International. Uh, just a question on the extent of leading edge erosion and degradation offshore, uh, commercializing the impact of that instead of it just being a big problem. And thirdly, the current solutions in the market. Okay, Andrew. Well, I'm pleased to report the Catapult is looking exactly into all of those points you made. What is the commercial impact of, uh, of uh, blade leading edge erosion? For those of you not familiar, if you spin blades in uh, salty air, you sometimes find the coatings come off the outer edge, which uh, over a period of time can lead to a production, or can lead to a production performance. Um, it's very pleasing to see the industry is actually pulling together very well. And I know that OEMs are working very hard behind the scenes to uh, uh, prevent it. But the Catapult has got a program of pulling the industry together to, first of all, do the quantification of what might it mean, and then looking at what are the potential solutions. And we've actually just taken receipt of uh, a test facility in our uh, plant in Blythe, where we have the, the major blade testing and drivetrain and electrical lamp facilities for looking at new plant to look at exactly at this phenomenon so we can spin samples of blade in, uh, in sprayed water conditions uh, to, to look at what is causing this and then how best to prevent it. But it's, uh, I can tell you other centres like mine are, across Europe are looking at the same phenomenon and it's, uh, it's something that I'm very pleased we're all going to pull jointly together to try and find the best solution for it. Okay, does anybody else want to comment on that? Nope. Any further questions? Oh, one over here. Good afternoon. My name is Tony Granville from University of Exeter. My question uh, tilts towards the the campaign on offshore wind. To the panel, please. Often, I think often the uh, offshore wind is being. Uh, it's been boxed to talk about electricity generation and not and one aspect of the energy vector, which is heat, is often silent on it. Can the panel just talk about it? Because I know the offshore wind can be unlocked, the potential of offshore wind can be locked to uh, treat uh, a little of decarbonization in regards to heat generation. Thank you. I think um, heat decarbonisation is probably a topic that's being discussed elsewhere in this conference, but I'm sure some of our panel will have a view and an answer to that. Matthew, do you want to come in? Yeah, really good question. Actually, uh, doing something about heat unlocks greater potential for offshore wind. Um, if we just use offshore wind for power generation, then we're sort of limited to the maximum demand for power generation and how much storage we have. Uh, one of the several, and we'll need all of them, uh, ways of trying to decarbonize heat, and particularly domestic heat, is substitution of gas in the gas grid. 
uh, and there's proposals to try that out in Leeds uh, and potentially other places um, over the next few years. Um, electrochemistry is dramatically reducing in cost. So the combination of generating power with wind farms, electrochemistry making hydrogen uh, or uh, ammonia uh, as another storage vector, uh, which you can then use either in the gas grid for heating in homes, or you can store and then you can burn it in a gas turbine when uh, the wind is not blowing. Um, that unlocks the opportunity to suddenly use offshore wind theoretically for a sort of hundred percent of, uh, of your energy uh, because you're converting it into another vector. So actually um, low cost, uh, large scale uh, renewable electricity is one of the ways in which we can tackle the, the heat decarbonisation issue um, as well as heat pumps as well as all the other district heating, syn gas, all the other stuff that we need to try in parallel. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Does anybody else have an answer to that? Okay, um, we have now reached our, our time limit of 12.30 and I have been asked to wrap up the session on time, so I will do that. Um, I think we've had some very interesting uh, thoughts, uh, uh, really a thought-provoking uh, set of presentations from our panel members today. I think if there's one message I would go back to, it's perhaps Jonathan's at the start, which is it's up to us to spread the word about the opportunity behind offshore wind. My thanks to you for attending this opening session. I hope you found it as informative and, yes, inspiring as I did. And please now join me in thanking our panel, Jonathan, Benj, Hoop, Andrew Jimison, Matthew and Andrew Reid. Thank you.